we're on a subway platform in West Oakland, California to talk about Dead Space. And here's the game's creator, Glenn Schofield, to tell you why we're here. We have so many great examples of sound design within the game, but one in particular that really got me was uh, in the bar train room. Don Vecca was uh, telling me one day, he's like, Glenn, I'm going under, I was going in the bar train, we went under the bay, and it's the worst sound in the history of man, or something like that. And I'm like, record it, you know? And so, next day, he's hanging out the bar train, getting uh, the sound when it's in the tunnel and everything. He brings it in, he plays it for me. And... It was awful. It was like screeching, and I'm like, oh man, it's great, you know? Because what we were looking for is how can we scare people just with sound? No monster, no nothing. So. You're in zero G in the game. And zero G is like, you know, the absence of sound. So it's like, you get into an airlock and it's down quiet again. Then you open the door and it's just like. And people are running in the room. There's not one enemy, there may be a dead guy in the corner, but there's nothing happening. And they are running into it. They're running into walls, they're bumping in. They are just trying to get out of that room. It's so awesome. It's hard to say what makes Dead Space so memorable. Maybe for you, it's the marker lore, the dismemberment system, Isaac's helmet, how good it looks over a decade later, that commercial for the sequel where they grossed out your mom, but not often lauded for its level design. For each of the areas, from the satellite arrays to the medical bay to a botanical garden to another ship that tries to dock with the Ishimura, all look pretty similar. And I think that's a mistake. The consistent color palette makes the game's setting, the spaceship USG Ishimura, feel like a real place where people actually lived, ate, worked jobs, played zero-g basketball, and of course, conducted an illegal mining operation deep in restricted space, a trip which would go horribly wrong. So today we look at the project that turned cutting apart monsters into a game, gave us the chance to move and aim in a survival horror title, and created a franchise for Dead Space and its one sequel. <laughs> you heard me. Isaac, it's me. I wish I could talk to you. I'm sorry. In Dead Space, our team has been I'm sent sorry. by an interplanetary no, mining company to investigate a communications blackout at an operation they're running on the planet Aegis 7. It's all falling apart here. I can't believe what's happening. Don't worry, we're almost there. You'll be able to look her up once we're on board. Sounds like you do have a lot of catching up to do. Aegis 7 is forbidden to visit, but rich in resources desperately needed back on Earth. So the company defied the ban and sent the Ishimura to Aegis 7 to crack it open. So that's Ishimura. We find the massive mining ship floating above Aegis 7 with a chunk of the planet tethered below. Why is it all dark? I don't see any running lights. Corporal no lights, explosion. no broadcast, no That's movement. We meet Hammond, the team's stoic leader, Kendra, the skeptical systems hey, expert, done. and Isaac, the engineer. And these two red shirts don't bother learning their names. The Ishimura should be run by a thousand crew members, but here it is, silent and abandoned. And you're about to find out why. What the hell? I don't know, something's in the room with us. Jesus! Over fire! Over fire! Get the hell out of there! The door's unlocked! Run! The crew is separated and Isaac, an engineer, finds a tool. Let's talk about how Dead Space teaches us about its core mechanic, dismemberment. The Ishimura is overrun by necromorphs, the reanimated corpses of the ship's crew. They won't be killed easily by playing Dead Space like any other shooter, but they can die if two to three of their limbs are sliced off. So every encounter in Dead Space requires you to land precise hits to survive. First, shortly after our team is ambushed, Isaac is trapped in an elevator by a necromorph. The door slams shut and its limbs are severed. Next, Isaac finds a plasma cutter and a message, accompanied by a tooltip in case we somehow miss the subtlety smeared on the wall. Isaac, be careful. Shooting them in the body didn't seem to work. Go for the limbs, dismember them. So that's how Dead Space goes from what could have been a standard corridor shooter to a test of your aim under incredible... 
I guess they really wanted to be sure that... Forget about shooting him in the body. You gotta cut off the limbs. Okay, we get it. There's a shuttle train running through each wing of the Ishimura. Isaac! Isaac! Isaac's on one side of the track, Hammond and Kendra on the other. They need to get to the bridge, but the tram won't run. The data board is fried, but there should be a spare in the maintenance bay. There's also a broken tram blocking the tunnel that needs to be repaired. And here we set the structure for nearly every other Dead Space level. There's an imminent threat in a section of the Ishimura. If I can get to the bridge, I should be able to access the personnel files. You fix the tram, and I'll help you find Nicole. And Isaac has two to three objectives to complete before opening a final objective, usually involving a dramatic set piece. Isaac, get back to the Kelion and prep it for launch. We'll find out what we can from the bridge and meet you there. Isaac accomplishes his goal, but there's a twist. Now the game introduces a new problem we'll have to solve in the next level. Where's the captain? Deceased. What? How? I can't access that information. Find the captain and you'll find his rig. With his authorization codes, I can crack this computer wide open. And Dead Space begins with these three desperately trying to keep the Ishimura in the sky long enough to find a way off the ship, while what's left of the crew is hunting them. Playing through the first level, I was struck by how few encounters there actually were, and how much time I spent just walking in silence, listening to Isaac's breathing, and someone, somewhere, whispering. But the encounters that do happen set the stage for the next 11 levels. Depending on where the character was, is where the enemy came out. So what we were trying to do in many cases was the enemy would come out of vent and we'd go, oh shoot, back up. That starts another enemy coming out of the other vent. And so now you were in these tight quarters, but just by innovating a little bit on the way spawn points are, you can really get something special. Captain is dead in the medical bay, and the key to access the ship's computer is on his body. So it's time to catch a train. Looks like the crew barricaded the door to the emergency wing. You have to blow through it to get to the morgue. Get some thermite from medical storage and a shock pad from zero-g therapy. Get me the captain's rig codes and we'll find Nicole. Let's look at the two ways Dead Space teaches us about new enemies. First, the lurkers. These are necromorph babies with three tentacles that Isaac has to sever. But we see them for the first time behind unbreakable glass. So we understand how they operate before we have to face them for the first time. Next, the leapers. We meet these in the first level, and we've only faced slashers up until now. But when we see one for the first time, it's tucked away in a vent. It can't hurt us, and we can't hurt it. But now we know there's something new out there. Shortly after, it emerges at the end of a long room, but it closes that distance at a heartbeat and slices at us with its tail. So without taking us out of the action at all, Dead Space teaches us about the threats it's about to throw at you. We introduce the first zero gravity area where we can fling ourselves across the room and walk across most walls and ceilings, and a section without oxygen where the hull has been ripped open. But it's short enough that if you didn't invest in the air upgrade, you'll be fine for now. This is Senior Medical Officer Nicole Brennan transmitting ship-wide. We need more help. We don't have the resources to deal with this many cases. Hold him! Nurse, you hold him down! The Ishimura sent a group of colonists down to Aegis 7, supposedly, to mine the planet. But shortly after arriving, the whole colony began suffering from dementia, heightened aggression, hallucinations of long-dead loved ones, a wave of suicides, and more than a few murders. The planet was quarantined by the captain of the Ishimura leaving the colonists to tear each other apart on the surface below. When the dead began reanimating as something horrifying, a few survivors from Aegis 7 broke quarantine and launched shuttles to return to the Ishimura. They brought the infection with them. You found something down there, didn't you? Yes, we found something. So the texts were right all this time. I wouldn't be certain of that. There was nothing divine in what I saw. This level also introduces the two science officers on the Ishimura. Dr. Kine, the rational voice of caution, and Dr. Mercer, the enthusiastic religious zealot, who seems very excited about something they've found on the planet below. As a fun bonus, if you use a power node, the game's upgrade currency, you can unlock the room where Nicole recorded her video message to you. I had no idea this location exists in-game. That's just an incredible amount of detail. Like, the designers just killed it. Blast your way through the debris and find the captain's body. And, uh, <laughs> cause of death is not a mystery. But first, we meet the Infectors, who can quickly turn nearby corpses into necromorphs, including the captains. Find the captain's rig, and the codes will let Hammond and Kendra access the ship's computer. This would be good news, except... Shit, we've got bigger problems. The ship's engines are offline and our orbit is decaying. 
Get over to the engineering deck ASAP while I stay here and figure out what the problem is. So the ship is dropping towards the planet. You need to refuel the Ishimura, restart the gravity centrifuge, and fire the engine. And you hear the worst sound in the history of man. With the engine offline, orbit decay will begin in less than 10 hours. I just can't understand who would do this. If it's one of those crazy unitologist bastards, I'll break their neck. I saw this story on Chicxulub, which is the giant um, uh, crater that had the meteor that landed that most scientists, I guess everybody thinks, wiped out the dinosaurs. So I started thinking about that, and I'm like, wiped out the dinosaurs? Well, if it wiped out the dinosaurs, then that's how mammals started. You know, the Ice Age came in, and, and mammals started, then actually man came from that. So man is here because of the meteor. And I thought, what if it wasn't a meteor? What if it was something somebody planted? then man started because of somebody else or something else. And so archaeologists go down there and they discover that there's a marker. Then the question was, did they do it on purpose? And that's where you have faith. That's where unitology came from. We've seen references to unitology in earlier levels, especially in the crew scrawling on walls, where some are fearing for their lives, but others seem prepared and ready, even excited for the necromorph attack. And it's becoming clearer that most of the ship's crew, from the captain to the scientist to the colonists who went down to Aegis 7, were all unitologists. And while the planet is full of mineable resources, that isn't why they're here. You're forced into tighter environments with larger groups of necros here, but you have a ripper. You're locked in here with me! You fight your way through the gravity centrifuge and reassemble the machine while the leapers try to ruin your day. Get it running and the floor opens up beneath you. Gravity restores, but the air's gone. The exit is nearby, but it's covered in biomass that you can't run on, making it impossible to cross before the centrifuge mows you down. So you have to go the long way around the room in a race against time before your air runs out, where you're forced into small spaces with necromorphs. And if you don't take them out quick, you might expire before your oxygen does. If you survive, you reach the engine for a new enemy reveal. First, the game sent in groups of slashers, but they appear from far away, making them easy targets. And it's unclear at that distance that this one is any different. But if you don't take it out very carefully, swarmers will burst out of the pregnant necromorph and charge at you. You turn on the engine and we're rising, but... Wait, wait, we're not safe yet. The ship's asteroid defense system is offline. On the way up, the ship's going to pass through a debris field thrown up from the planet crack. We'll be ripped to pieces unless you restart it. Isaac, meet me at the bridge. You can do more good here than I can. So it's off to the bridge for chapter four. Just Hammond, Kendra, Isaac, and... Isaac. Isaac, where are you? It's me, Nicole. The Ishimura is headed straight into an asteroid field. Hammond needs us to reroute power from three terminals and manually fire on the asteroids until he can restart the auto defense systems. When were you going to tell us about the artifact, Hammond? This marker? I don't know anything about that. It's referenced in the captain's records. They brought it up from the planet. It's on the ship? In cargo. They think it's of alien origin, but I don't know what the hell it is. Hammond and Kendra bicker like the lovebirds they are about an artifact called the marker. Hammond's got a posh setup on the bridge, but sure, I'll go run all over the ship to keep us all. Shit! Stand back! Oh, that one was dead when I sealed the pod. Hammond launches an escape pod with a trapped necromorph inside. That definitely won't cause trouble later, and you can probably forget about it. We see a video log of the crew turning on Captain Matthias, and we find out he was in the morgue thanks to Dr. Kine, who may not be the voice of reason any longer. You cross outside the ship, narrowly avoiding the asteroids, and if you haven't upgraded your air capacity, you are cutting it real close. And you manually blast the incoming barrage until Hammond can restore the auto defenses. Defense system is on, you no longer have an asteroid problem. Wait, Isaac Hammond, you're not gonna believe this. Oxygen levels are falling. Something's poisoning hydroponics air production and whatever it is, it's filling the deck up with that organic stuff. We're not gonna have any air to breathe soon. But you do have an air problem. So it's back to the medical deck to make a poison that can kill. Isaac, make us whole again. This is the first of three returns to a prior level, but there's always enough new areas unlocked to reward exploring a place you thought you knew. It's clear you aren't the only survivor here, but <laughs> you're about to wish you were. What are you doing? Please remove the capsule. Your fight for survival is admirable, but pointless. Our future 
your future, the future of our race ends here. Allow me to introduce you to humanity's child, the children that will replace us, our greatest creation. Dr. Mercer is a believer. He's not only fascinated by the necromorphs, he's built a better one. This friggin' thing. Dr. Mercer's Hunter is a necromorph that regenerates and won't die, turning it into your own personal nemesis. And this took the level from just a retread to a terrifying experience. I'm here at the store and I can hear Mercer's creation clomping around outside looking for me. Maybe it has boundaries like Mr. X, I don't know, but up until now, the store has been a moment to relax. And now I'm racing through it as fast as possible. When you mix the virus, Mercer tires of your insolence and vents out all the air. You race for the security station to turn it back on, leading to this awesome moment. There are seven weapons in Dead Space, and most necromorphs are weak to one, making your loadout a game of rock, paper, scissors. The swarmers coming at Isaac right now are weak to flames, so I pull out my trusty flamethrower, but because there's no air in the room, it won't fire. Ripper works fine though. You finish the poison, but Mercer has you locked in the cryogenics lab with his creation. These specimens will return to Earth with me. I will spread their divine glory across the entire planet. So you have to use stasis on Mercer's hunter and freeze it in the cryo lab. You can have a nice long walk back to the tram station now, but you can't forget there are more people alive on this ship, and one of them is helping the necromorphs. You and your poison step off the tram into hydroponics, a huge level with 10 objectives before you can face off with whatever's lurking inside food storage. There are 10 Weezers throughout hydroponics polluting the air. If you get close to one, the air is so toxic that Isaac's backup oxygen kicks in. The fire hose of plasma ammo you've been receiving up until now is drying up to a trickle, making you stomp on every Xbox you find looking for more. The Xbox is everything the rock is, cutting edge. Clear the air and Isaac picks a fight with a building. So you have a zero gravity game of hot potato with this absolute unit who flings pods at you and slams tentacles your way. The boss fights in Dead Space are epic, but don't have much to do with the rest of the game. Keep moving and just fling everything you have at him and you'll take him down. Isaac, you did it. It's up to us now. I've got a plan to get off this ship. I've located an SOS beacon on the mining deck. If you can get down there and activate it, we might be able to send a distress call. Finally, things are going your way, and you might even make it off this. Isaac, make us whole again? Oh, right, Nicole. This may be our last chance of getting out of here alive, Isaac. There's an asteroid loaded up in the mining bay waiting to be smelted. If you attach the SOS beacon to it, you can launch it away from the ship to make a clean broadcast. The beacon's on the maintenance subdeck. You can launch the asteroid from the control room. Couldn't be easy, could it? The mining deck is a series of tight corridors with the exception of two huge set pieces. There's loud screaming machinery everywhere, the game frequently boxes you in on both sides, sending in pregnant necromorphs that will turn your day from bad to worse if you rupture their sacks. I read another report on the colonist dementia. It seemed to start after they removed the marker from the planet. God knows how long it was down there. So we need a beacon. We cross a conveyor section to find one and run into... Isaac? Nicole. Is that really you? It feels like it's been so long. But I can help you now. Come with me. She can't reach us, but she unlocks the storage area where the beacon is held and runs off. Okay, the door's unlocked, Isaac. I can't get over to you, but I'll find a way. I love you. The two set pieces are huge open rooms in the level, where you jettison asteroid pieces into space with kinesis, and then release an asteroid held in place by four gravity tethers. Flying about in zero-g and walking on the ceiling feel like a huge reward after all that claustrophobia. But the equipment holding the asteroid will slice you in two if you're not fast enough, so you scramble to the top, set the beacon, destroy the tethers, and send it flying into space. Hopefully within range of someone who can help you. Beacon's on its way. All functions normal and broadcasting wideband. Now we just have to hope somebody's listening. I thought I saw my brother again. What? The comms array receiver isn't responding. Isaac, can you get back to the bridge? We need that array online or we can't receive signals from anyone responding to the beacon. The Ishimura can't receive a response to your distress call, so it's back to the bridge for chapter eight. This might be one of the shortest levels in the game, but it sets up a key moment. We put the comms array back together and we're finally able to receive a repeating message that's been broadcasting to you over and over for the last hour. This is USM Valor, widecasting on all frequencies to USG Ishimura in response to your SOS. 
We picked up your escape pod, number 47, and are en route to your position. This message will repeat every 30 seconds until you respond. You go back to the defense cannons to blast the monstrosity off the hull, and your rescue ship approaches. Why did they open the pod? Damn it. Oh my god. It's headed right for us. Isaac! Isaac! Fuck out of there! I'm falling apart here. Isaac. <coughs> Isaac, are you there? I think I've located a shuttle on the crew deck. The flight log says it needs a new singularity core, but we can probably salvage one from the valley. Head to the cargo bay and see if you can help Hammond. In his condition, he may not last long. Kendra tries real hard to sound concerned about Hammond as you make your way to what's left of the valor. They might have been here to rescue you, although their logs state they were onto the Ishimura's side mission to find the marker. But they're all dead, torn apart by the necromorph in the escape pod. And because they had stasis units in their uniforms, their reflexes are sped up and they've become, <laughs> I kid you not, they're called twitchers. Top of the morning, Chilis! As you search through the wreckage, Dr. Kine reaches out to Isaac, the same Dr. Kine who killed the captain. If you really can repair the shuttle, there is a better use for it than just running away. You push your way through the blasting flames of the engine room and retrieve the Singularity Core. You got it? Oh my god! You got it! That's the piece we need. Get to the crew deck. Over here! I've been trying to reach but my car was out. You and Hammond reunite just before he repaints the floor. Fuel containment ruptures and Isaac escapes the Valor just before it blows. Now it's onto the crew quarters to see if you can get the escape shuttle working. Fools! This is what we have been searching for all these years. This is what we have been waiting for. Don't listen to them. Come back. Come back. You enter the crew decks and find everyone dead, masked with the same head wound. No way to know if they chose this. Nearby, someone sings a sorrowful version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It's almost peaceful so peaceful that you drop your guard. Dr. Kine is hiding in security, talking to someone named Amelia. Amelia? No. No, 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 the shuttle is mine. I control access to the shuttle. If I could make the journey, I could fix everything. But he won't let you have access to the shuttle until you get it running, so we're off on a treasure hunt. As you find the nav cards, you solve a block puzzle to progress your way through the crew quarters. But Dr. Mercer releases his creation on you once more, so now you have to unsolve that puzzle as fast as possible while the hunter tries to skewer you. If you escape, Dr. Kine tells you the ship will never reach Earth in its condition. But we can stop the outbreak. There's a hive mind on Aegis 7 controlling the necromorphs, and it wants the marker returned to its planet. If we, you, you mean me, of course, return the marker from where it was stolen, we might end this nightmare. This level is a welcome return to the sprawling layout of the earlier stages, but the game pits you against some of its toughest challenges, like four pregnant necromorphs in one room. You reach the ship and get it running. Kine asks you to wait for him, so you do. And this is the eeriest action pause yet. You notice you can test fire the rockets, so why not? and Mercer's creation strikes. So you stasis it on the launch bay and melt it with the shuttle jets. And now it's time for us to take the voyage together. Transcend death. The future take its course. Join me as I gaze upon the face of God. I love how unceremonious this moment is. In a Resident Evil game, Mercer would have turned himself into some giant nightmare boss, but here, he becomes just another monster. And if you're fast enough, you can kill him without him even having the chance to attack you. <sighs> no hard feelings. I need you to guide the undocking procedure while I start the shuttle's engines. This will make us whole again. 
I didn't put this together until I reviewed my footage to write this script, but on my first playthrough, Kaino was felt like one of the few sane people left willing to break protocol to do what's right. But this line changes everything. If you haven't played Dead Space before, I'll explain why this is important in a few minutes. But if you have, you know Kine isn't just doing this to set things right. I don't know if Kine is crazy or not, but we need that shuttle. Let's keep him on our side. For now. Kine takes the shuttle to the flight deck and we head to the cargo bay to load a very special delivery. Up until now, we've only seen drawings or statues of the marker, so you might not expect it to be two stories tall. This monstrosity that begets monstrosities is bright red, shaped like a DNA helix, and according to the wiki, has the genetic code of the necromorphs etched into it. This is marker 3A, and if they named it that, it means there are more. After loading it onto the ship, Kine is ready to fly it back to Aegis 7, but... Sorry, Isaac. I couldn't let him go through with it. My department's been looking for this place for a long time. See what Kine didn't know was? It was the government's mess to begin with. This whole planet is one big experiment. The marker? This <laughs> divine relic? Made by man. They reverse engineered it a couple of hundred years ago from the real marker, a true alien artifact recovered on Earth. Then they brought it to Aegis 7 and activated it. And you've seen the result. The stuff of nightmares. Time was right about the hive mind. The marker would contain it, but that doesn't matter now, does it? I have the marker, and this entire system can go to hell. See you around. Or maybe not. So now Isaac has to- Isaac, Nicole, I need you to help me. Help us, now. Nicole meets you in the control room to recall Kendra's shuttle. Isaac, is that really you? I never thought we'd be together again. God, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what I did. We'll I come wanna... back to that. You need to get it back now, Isaac. You can pilot the shuttle remotely from here. Kendra ejects, plummeting down to Aegis 7. Isaac, what the hell are you doing? You're making a big mistake. You and Nicole board the recalled shuttle to return the marker to its resting place. You're doing the right thing, Isaac. We're together now. The way it always should have been. I knew you'd come back for me. Nothing can stop us now. Oh shoot, spoilers. Sorry, sorry. You land on Aegis 7 and find the aftermath of a massacre. You're alone in the ship. Nicole is already on the ground, waving you onwards to bring the marker to the excavation site. And you escort mission this massive monolith of death past waves of enemies until you arrive where the hive mind waits. Thank you, Isaac. I always believed in you. I knew you'd return to me. We are whole again, Isaac. We are whole. The giant chunk of Aegis 7 tethered to the Ishimura has come loose and will collide into the planet in a few minutes, so you better get back to... Nicole is dead, and has been this whole time. What she sent you the first moment we see in the game would be her last message. Recorded here in this room as life on the Ishimura was falling apart. And Isaac repressed what he couldn't bear to remember. While I can't say I never saw it coming, given that Nicole doesn't seem at all concerned about her own safety or yours, I'm still impressed after all this time because it's so difficult to pull off a twist that recontextualizes a story well. Never seeing Isaac's face or hearing his voice other than helps a great deal. By the end of Dead Space 1, we still know very little about Isaac, except for what we've experienced together. I loved you. I always loved you. See? You're insane. We know that on some level he's aware of Nicole's fate from this line. God, I'm, 
I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what I did. I never the marker is using Isaac's memories to manipulate him, and it could only know Nicole had done something to apologize for if Isaac knew it first. You race to the shuttle. Kendra beats you there, but she seems to have forgotten about the massive hive mind that wanted the marker back. This fight is a lot more active than the Leviathan, using what you learned during the tentacle drag sequences to blast the yellow weak spots and send the hive mind crashing to the ground. Isaac jumps into the shuttle and blasts off as a huge chunk of Aegis 7 careens back down to the surface, destroying the colony, the marker, and everything that led to this nightmare. For many of us, including me, Dead Space exists at a perfect moment for survival Six. horror games. The PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 generation provided enough graphical fidelity that you could convey human emotion closer than ever to a film for the first time. The game's main inspiration, Resident Evil 4, proved you could use action to complement a horror experience and sell a lot of copies doing it. So there was a lot of money and creativity poured into scaring us. And this means that we could use all this technology to tell really personal stories in video games, and at the end of this relentlessly tense, ear-punishing, uncomfortable thrill ride was a story about a man who couldn't accept that the woman he loved was gone, and the marker that twisted his guilt to be whole again. We're on a subway platform in West Oakland, California to talk about Dead Space, and here's the game's creator. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out this next one as well. Be sure to leave a like if you have a moment. It really does help me to share this with more people. And subscribe so you never miss a new release. Thanks, and have a great day.